Greetings, dear people. Greetings to all of you. I am Ian McKenzie. I am the host of this weekly live show, The Crow's Nest, which is uh, in some ways inspired by the recently launched School of Mythopoetics, of which I am a co-steward. And uh, the aim of this particular show, this, um, I guess, yeah, it's, a, it's sort of a live topical uh, inquiry into important themes of the day from a mythopoetic lens. And uh, for this particular edition, I'm delighted to be joined by Samara Concepcion. Welcome, Samara. Thank you, Ian. It's a joy to be here mm. with you. Um, thank you for having me uh, in your crow's nest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, welcome. Uh, the impulse behind this conversation was somewhat twofold. One, because um, you, of course, and we'll get into this in a moment, are directing a new documentary called Birth, A New Story. And uh, through a sort of synchronous, synchronous, a series of events, uh, including the fact that uh, one of the uh, uh, subjects featured in your film is a dear friend of mine, Mia Califf, who wrote a book called The Secret Life of Babies, uh, that uh, she got in touch with me to see if you know somebody would interview her. I said, I'd, I'd love to interview you, you know, good friend. And uh, anyway, that's how we met. And through that uh, conversation and that collaboration, uh, you asked if I wanted to come on board a little more as a producer on the project. Uh, and uh, I said, yeah, that sounds sounds right. And so, yeah, here we are. And um, I'd love to begin this conversation by, again, diving into birth from a mythopoetic lens. And first uh, to ask you, what was it that stirred you to to step into the role of directing a film, which you know, I know from having directed numerous films now, how much work it is. <laughs> how it really is like having a child over often many years. And uh, what was it in you that said, oh, I need to make a film? Mm, thank you, Ian. Well, in essence, what moves me to tell this story and filmmaking is such a brilliant way to story tell, um, is a deeply felt reverence and respect for the innate intelligence of the birth process the um, untamable wonder and wild nature of birth. And over the last seven years, I've had the honor of regularly witnessing how birth unfolds when women feel safe, held, unobserved and undisturbed, and therefore able to really surrender to the altered state that birth intends to be. And from that place to really truly be able to follow their innate uh, body wisdom. And those births, they look and feel most importantly very different to um, our dominant story of birth, the, the story of birth we're all very familiar with that um, kind of dramatic Hollywood birth scene where the birthing woman is screaming in agony, she's surrounded by a crowd that's. Uh, coaching her to push uh, faster and harder and the doctor comes in to rescue her and her baby and her flawed body with with the drugs and the instruments and um, and all the technology and actually this brings me to something that uh, Pat McCabe said in one of your conversations on the mythic uh, masculine podcast she said uh, something that's actually very relevant here she said that we think we know the feminine and masculine energies, but actually we only really know how they express themselves within our current paradigm. And so it's the very, it's, it's exactly the same case with birth. We think we know birth. We think birth is that, uh, that dramatic scene. Um, but really the way we, we know birth today is more of a reflection of the paradigm it most often unfolds within, which is the kind of obstetric, medicalized, technocratic paradigm. Um, and that story is so, is so powerful, so um, sensational, uh, to some extent quite traumatic, if not, if not a potential reflection of our own experienced trauma that you know many of us a lot of us sadly have experienced as we were welcomed outside 
And so what that story does without us even knowing it is that it seeds this, um, this belief that birth is inherently dangerous, that it always requires medical attention, um, and that without the technology and uh, and yeah, without the the technology and the medical attention, the the it would go terribly wrong, mm -hmm. right? And so, so I'm kind of um, offering you all of this because there is. I myself and many other birth keepers know and have known for a very long time that birth can be a different way. And if we really were to enter a paradigm or a way of seeing birth, um, again, from this place of, of deep respect and reverence for a force really that is way greater than us, way beyond our control, way beyond our, our ability to measure it, um, if we were to hold the birthing woman's and birthing beings' feelings as, as central, then, well, birth tends to unfold in a very different way within that paradigm. And so because this is something that I've seen over, over many years, and um, birth being one of my very favorite subjects of conversation, I've come to realize that when I share my birth stories, uh, what I'm most, most familiar with, People are very, um, um, people are very surprised. People almost don't quite believe me when I tell them that, you know, I have a whole lot of first time uh, births, first time mothers that give birth, you know, in five to six hours, who don't describe their births as painful. Um, and I guess, I guess I just want to make this story more available um, mm. to the general public. And film seems to be a really good way to do this. And I think it's a really important time for this story to be told. Um, uh, because I, I certainly recognize um, birth as deeply significant and deeply in interrelated with our kind of societal health. So, um, yeah, I just really, I really want to um, offer our audience a, a new way of perceiving birth. Um, and that often comes with a new way of perceiving life. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. You know, it strikes me that when I was, um, well, I've been, I've been close to two births. And one was a friend's, uh, a friend, it was partner giving birth and I was close to the, you know, I'm going to call it almost impact zone. <laughs> and, you know, and I don't mean that as a, as a destructive thing, but as a being that close to the portal of life coming in. And the other of course was the birth of my son. And I'll say that, you know, there's certain parallels that were very clear to me when or being in that space around this, this ebb and this intelligence of birth and the similar ebb and intelligence of death that, you know, I've uh, spent a number of years now studying with a fellow named Stephen Jenkinson, who, uh, you know, spent many years at the deathbed of the dying and the way that he's spoken about death and he's advocated for death, uh, or at least the palliative care industry, which if you look at the root of the word uh, to palliate, right, means to cover or to, to hide away that there's a sort of similar impulse that seems in a culture to hide away that portal in this case an exit right of, of say a soul exiting and a soul is coming in because there's such p powerful moments powerful thresholds and that in terms of uh at least what stevens talked about advocating for in the death industry as he calls it he he rather than what he sees now is often a, a kind of patient centric um orientation right it's sort of like the patient or the the dying person knows what's best for them and he says you know, by and large, that was never the case, <laughs> or very rarely did a dying person who's never died before know what they actually needed to to pull it off right in a, right in a good way. So what he advocated for was death centric dying, right, which is a very different understanding. So what I hear and kind of what you're saying, perhaps, is that there's also you're advocating possibly for birth centered uh, birthing. Maybe maybe that's one way to say it. Like the sense that 
that birth is a is a almost like a, a visitation or a deity or some kind of uh portal yeah opening and that you know we are uh we in the sense of all all involved in that unfolding uh have a certain um you know there's a necessity to essentially to tune into that right to that intelligence versus apply so much of what we see with uh a sort of medical industrial model which is domination right kind of like hurry it along how do we get through it uh and so yeah as you say like the veil or the the frame of reference now with birth and and also with death is that yeah it's a deviation from regular scheduled programming you know back to life back to productivity back to those things and so yeah that's also why i feel it's so vital to to sort of reclaim and restore um this deep reverence right and also kind of um yeah humility to to that 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 process is intelligent but i'd love for you to speak a bit to that mm, absolutely absolutely and it does require humility um so so there is this essential uh, missing piece in our current collective understanding of birth and so when just to clarify when i speak of the uh, innate intelligence of the birth process i'm actually speaking of something quite specific uh, which the documentary will really seek to clarify and offer to the public. Um, so when I refer to the innate intelligence of the birth process, of course, I don't want to reduce it in any way because I do believe it's way greater than us and really truly not something that we can fully comprehend through the mind. But there is something called the hormonal physiology of birth, the kind of blueprint of birth. Mm. And it's just this incredible fine orchestration of birth hormones that flow through a woman's body when she's given birth or a birthing being's body um, who is giving birth and this uh, hormonal blueprint is was designed is designed to ensure that birth unfolds optimally for mother and baby now what's fascinating is that this this uh, refined and super powerful orchestration of birth hormones will not unfold unless a woman feels safe, held, unobserved, undisturbed, and she can really drop into that altered state, that limbic trance state of birth, where the rational mind completely takes the back, the back seat, and she really, um, the birthing being really, uh, yeah, uh, yields into that altered state. Um, and that's when that innate intelligence can unfold fully. So what's interesting is that we haven't actually quite understood what preserves the integrity of birth and what keeps birth as safe as it can be, which is, which is this reverence and respect and acknowledgement that if we, as you say, if we, if we just kind of, um, acknowledge this innate intelligence and and become humble um, space holders trusting that this force is moving through the birthing being in the way it needs to um, often birth unfolds in a very different way when that's the case um, and that's what i yeah really really want to offer this missing piece to our audience because i've seen just how much of a difference it makes to to the families that I work with, once they have this missing piece, everything makes so much sense. The fact that you know most births are becoming medical events these days, it all makes sense once we understand this missing piece. Um, because the, the environment needs to be conducive to this innate un intelligence unfolding. If it's not, this fine chemistry will actually not express itself. Mm -hmm. um, Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, I'm curious as well that you know there's some comments here coming in live as well, which we appreciate. That uh, there is, there does seem to be a consequence, of course, to how we come into the world. In I, I don't know if the term again is epigenetics or there's other yeah trauma. You know, the wake of how we've come in and how that leads to all sorts of you know specific challenges or imprints or, or um, ways of needing to heal those those blueprints or those imprints which i think we're just starting to really understand now um in the west of oh wow you know you came in in a certain way and that is directly related to 
say some deep need or attachment trauma or you know all these ways that you know show up uh, much later uh, and and actually need to be tended really really importantly so in that sense i guess what i'm saying is the the consequence of not partnering with birth which is maybe one way i'd say it yeah like partnering with the birth intelligence yeah by by putting forth a kind of um like essentially the, the the efficiency you know mindset or the let's get through it and get it over with or this is the way to do it kind of um consequence that there there's yeah there's unintended consequences of that right not just simply okay well, great we got the birth out mother and baby are fine which of course is is such an important factor but how that happens actually yes is is fans out for you know a generation or two or more uh, and yeah, we're just really reckoning with that, I think, in the West. Absolutely. And you mentioned um, Mia Caliph at the very beginning of this conversation. Um, oh, Mia is a precious gem when it comes to understanding how our prenatal experiences, our prenatal and birth experiences shape our world. Um, and I've learned immensely um, from Mia about this. And actually, I'll tell a very quick story that actually unfolded last week. Um, it's actually a really beautiful story. I was um, in this park, um, kind of children's park, and I noticed this really sweet looking little girl and she was with her father and I approached him and I said, wow, she seems like such a gentle being. And he turned towards me and he said, well, that's, that's funny that you say that because we're actually having a whole lot of issues with her at the moment. She keeps hitting people's faces. This, this little girl's like two and a half, very little. Mm. Um, she keeps scratching and hitting other children's faces. Um, and we really don't know what to do with it. We've kind of approached uh, many different, you know, uh, professionals, different perspectives and opinions, and nothing seems to be working. And I remembered Mia's teachings and I just kind of felt this impulse to ask him, well, how, how was she born? And he just kind of paused for a moment. He was like, oh, wow. Um, uh, she was born through forceps and she was premature and then she had all these kind of tubes kind of stuck up her nose and down her throat and um, they showed me pictures and it seemed like a very, um, yeah, very painful experience as, a, as an initial, as an initial first, first contact, you know, first mm. touch, experience touch. Um, and... And so really, to me, at least, what this little girl is, is expressing is what she learned really, really early on. Um, she's really showing us how it was for her. Um, and she's only really just repeating something that, that, that she learned very early on. Um, and so there's, there's ways of approaching this. Um, Mia teaches it beautifully, but it, um, yeah, there's, there's ways of approaching the child with immense compassion and, um, yeah, and letting them know that that we know we are aware that they are expressing something through through what could be perceived as violence. They are actually showing something that was was learnt, you know, a memory. Mm. Well, thanks for that. Um, you know, I'm curious. I know in the film you're going to be or you have spoken with some birth keepers. I think from more traditional cultures or more intact cultures i believe you're, you know you're planning on heading to mexico and yeah i'm curious to hear some of the the stories from there some of the the ways in which you've recognized that they approach birth differently in cultures of course in this new and ancient story of birth which is in some ways you know the modern interpretation of birth is somewhat of a deviation it feels from of course how how cultures with that intelligence have practiced uh, being in relationship with birth Mm, absolutely. One of my greatest um, and most beloved teachers is traditional midwife Angelina Martinez Miranda. She's a Mexican midwife uh, practicing in Morelos, Mexico. Um, her, I mean, her whole practice, which really has been preserved through the generations, she started attending births when she was a child, when she was eight, um, mm. is, is really rooted in in relationship, in love, in, in human connection, in touch and affection. Um, it's actually really simple and yet super profound. She receives women all the time who, you know, who, who are told by their Western doc doctors that they'll never 
be able to conceive, that they'll never get pregnant. And they go and see Angelina for a couple of weeks and they get pregnant. And that's because she she touches their body, she bathes them like she would bathe a child. I mean, her her level of care is just, I mean, I really look forward to sharing this um, in the documentary because it's it's just such a beautiful story. How she, yeah, so she will bathe these women as if they were babies, singing them songs, um, blessing their bodies, like literally holding them whilst they're in their, their bath water. And then she'll get them out of the bath and massage them and, um, you know, cook them food and, and nourish, nourish their whole being and cradle them, hold them, really invite them to grieve what um, perhaps they haven't had the opportunity to grieve in their lifetime. So it's a really, it's a really holistic um, approach to, yeah, to, to the significance of, of conception, pregnancy and birth, which actually are understood in those cultures, not as separate events, but very much a continuum. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's just a little taste of yeah. <laughs> Angelina's way. <laughs> yeah, that sounds very uh, nourishing, nurturing. Um, mm. And, you know, so, you know, again, I'm thinking of being in a professional's office, you know, here in the West and and that kind of care, right? Is It's like there's always this separation in the professional environment, right? It seems between, you know, the, the consultant or the, I mean, even the doctor or something, but I can't imagine um, that level of, you know, crossing that that care boundary, which is likely something that, again, I'm sure the 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 one seeking to give birth are so deeply needing, and yet, you know, it doesn't seem accessible, or it just wouldn't even be thought of in a way that this uh, this midwife has so clearly sort of practices ancient or not ancient, like an older nurturing intelligence. Which, of course, it makes sense why you know the environment of the body would need to feel that level of receptivity. I think to to be to be able to conceive, you know, versus being, I don't know, tight and constricted and, you know, all of that. So yeah, it, it, there's a clear link of, of recognizing that intelligence there. Um, yeah, thanks Absolutely. for that. Absolutely. And when you think of, um, I mean, I'll speak particularly of the female body uh, yearning or desiring to conceive, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's very much the act of receiving that is um, encouraged to to be nurtured in, in these traditions, right? So receiving receiving nourishment, receiving love and affection and touch, um, and really getting that body into like a very soft and receptive, relaxed place. Um, and it's really interesting to even just witness how we approach conception. <laughs> Uh, most often here these days, it's all about the doing and and this and that and uh, all the testing and the um, and yeah and we skip this really essential vital part that um, I think was was very much understood at some point in time. Definitely still very much practiced by Anfina herself. That you know if if one is to become a mother or a parent, a life bringer. Um, it's it's kind of important that we've been mothered ourselves in some way. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, it reminds me. I mean, really, this there's this question of love. Like, how does one learn love? And um, I mean, again, this is something that uh, Stephen spoke to Jenkinson again. The sense that you know you you learn love by being loved. I mean, it seems mm-hmm. seems pretty clear that it it can be. Yeah, it can be hard to to recognize or to to give without first being on the receiving end. And I mean, I know as a parent, you know, again, my son now he's three and a half, and you know, I I recognize, I mean, well, my role really, but also my limitations, mm-hmm. right? That 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 the necessity for uh, other caregivers, right, to be present and to be available, uh, because yeah how often i feel strained i feel stressed i have a bad day or um mother as well again like you know we're 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 sort of you know clearly not superhuman in our capacity to meet his needs all the time uh and yet how that same mania for productivity for um you know just getting by you know living and this kind of 
age makes it so difficult to to be as present as as certainly both of us want to and of course we try our best and parents try their best but that same yeah the same continuation and it makes me really wonder again what is a what is a child centric culture really look like and i don't think it looks like kids pirate packs at you know the fast food restaurants or you know like as in that to me is is the kind of ghost of what a kid child centric culture would actually look like um. in, in how it would arrange and orchestrate all of its understandings like a culture's understanding of, of what's worth doing because they recognize the impact of course on the multi-generational uh you know wake of of how we are with the children is you know how the world will become mm. oh absolutely and what's so beautiful about children is that they learn so much through um through our state of being <laughs> way more than through mm. our words <laughs> Right, so it is. It is. It's so common for for parents to be isolated in their parenting, um, and um, and yeah, it's and yeah, and then again, I guess that offers a certain kind of model to the child. I mean, this brings me to something that is called la cerrada ceremony when a woman's just had a baby um, in Mexican culture. This is actually offered to the men as well when when the birth experience was really um, uh, left them feeling a bit tender or maybe when the transition was just a little bit too much of a shock, um, the men received this too. So again, they're bathed and then um, they're kind of cradled in these rebosos for a number of reasons. But again, the importance and the recognition that this that the parents are about to deeply nurture another child and they need to be deeply nurtured themselves. And mm -hmm. so the midwife and the community come together and literally give the parents a big hug because <laughs> um, they're about to pour so much into this child and they need they, they truly need to be um, fully nourished themselves. Mm. Beautiful image. Mm. Wow. Well, Samara, we're getting to close at least of this uh, crow's nest. Uh, you know, we, we try to keep it lean here and and you know disciplined. <laughs> and I've appreciated our, our initial touch in in this conversation. Uh, one thing I do want to say is uh, tomorrow I'm actually going to be live uh, with Jacob Fortune Lloyd, who is a actor as well as the executive producer uh, of this film. Uh, Jacob is uh, you may recognize him from the Netflix series The Queen's Gambit of which uh, I did as well. And uh, he, he's very curious about fatherhood and, and approaching that decision. And, and so he had some questions for me. He's also a listener to the Mythic Masculine podcast. And so, yeah, uh, Samara put us in touch. And so we're going to have a conversation tomorrow, which will be more at length around that question, you know, fatherhood and birth and all this. Uh, but for our listeners now, Samara, maybe you could say a little bit uh, just to lead us out on where the film is at now, birth a new story. Yeah and oh, uh, yes. what the invitation is to the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've decided, well, I've decided to crowdfund this project um, to be able to keep it as like independent as possible. Uh, we currently only probably have about 10 to 15% of the footage we need to make a full length documentary film. And um, yeah, we plan to travel as well to Mexico and Bali um, seeing midwife Robin Lim in Bali. And so um, we're running our crowdfunding campaign through the whole month of June. It ends on the 30th of June. Um, and yeah, any contributions at this stage are just an immense gift. We really hope we can make this. Um, so yeah, if you feel moved to support our crowdfunding um, project, which really does need support at this stage, you can head to birthingnewstory.com um, and yeah, support whatever you can. There's some really generous and exciting rewards you can check there. And yeah, thank you so much. Beautiful. Well, thanks for your time today, Samara, and uh, to all of you who've tuned in and who will listen to this in the future. Bye. Bye.